Over the past uh, 20 years or so, there's been a new wave of randomized trials in development economics. And we're now accumulating uh, evidence and some general lessons are starting to emerge. Some of these things are, uh, can inform policy in a, in a broad perspective as background knowledge. So for example, there's a lot of belief that, uh, that it was okay to charge in education and health and that that would not necessarily curtail demand so much. Um, starting to accumulate evidence from a variety of different sources that prices, in fact, can have a very big impact on take-up. That, uh, that doesn't answer the question of what the optimal price is, but we're starting to, to get some generalizable lessons. Often a lot of these comes from uh, uh, behavioral economics as well. Um, or in education, uh, often you, you find that there are some of the lessons are things that weren't really on economists' radar screens initially. So economists thought a lot about incentives for providers. They thought a lot about school choice. Um, and there's very interesting results in that area. But by getting the field and doing research on, uh, and having the discipline of randomized trials to, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to force you to pay, forces you to pay attention to issues that one might not otherwise pay attention to. One of the things that's come out across a number of contexts in India and Africa is that education systems are often pitched at a very different level than the typical student. Students fall behind and it's very hard to catch up. So that's, that's come across in different contexts. Some of these things that are coming out have lessons for economics or for thinking about development. But in addition, randomized trials are generating uh, practical, uh, uh, very practical new approaches to uh, development challenges. I could talk a little bit about an example on water treatment. But let me just uh, move on to make sure I cover things. Um, one question is, what is the connection between these insights that are coming out of randomized trials and development research more broadly and actual policy? How many of these, now that we're starting to get to the position where there's evidence from multiple contexts that uh, certain approaches don't seem to work or do work, is that feeding into policy? Let me talk about, start out by talking about a couple ex of examples where it has. I think the most dramatic example, let me, um, you know, there's a question, I think part one of the themes in the previous uh, talk was, you know, what is the impact of research? Does it have any impact? Is it affecting the real world? And that, that's a question that researchers are always being asked. Let me make the argument that just looking at this one case of conditional cash transfers, uh, you see a tremendous impact of research. And perhaps even if there'd been no other, no other impact of research, this might alone justify uh, the, the investment in it. So conditional cash transfers, for those of you who aren't familiar, is a redistributive program. So uh, it was pioneered in Mexico. So Mexico, like many countries, had a patchwork system of social programs, a lot of political patronage involved. They tried out, and uh, this was done, I think this, I think this actually illustrates another uh, aspect of why research and uh, departments have an important role. So it was implemented by Santiago Levy, who was an economist who taught at BU for a while, then went to the Mexican government. So he, brought, he was working for the government, but he had an academic background. Um, he suggested that they try, let's try a system of cash grants to families if the families get preventative health care for their kids, basic health care for their kids, and have the kids in school. And so um, they tried this, and they implemented it in a way that allowed a rigorous evaluation. And um, the, there's a history in Mexico that when a new administration comes in, they get rid of the old social programs and create new ones. In this case, they had clear evidence of the impact. And they were able to see that this actually increased schooling, that it led to better health outcomes. And when the new administration saw the results, instead of canceling the program, they renamed the program. And they, in fact, expanded it. At that point, um, due in part to the uh, work within the Mexican government, in part to the academic work on this, but largely due to the, uh, but also largely due, I don't want to put any, any one institution, uh, give them disproportionate credit other than the Mexican government, um, uh, due in part to the work of, of uh, the Inter-American Development Bank and the World Bank, this was, this idea was spread to many other countries, and this, this program is now in more than 30 countries.
And you can debate, you know, there's room for debate of the, on the merits of this program. There's other, other you know, it depends on, on what the objective function of the policymakers are. But to the extent that policymakers have a, have a redistributive uh, uh, element in their preferences, or that citizens do, and votes suggest they seem to do that, um, and then this, I think, is, is something that can be counted as a tremendous success, a very wide-scale program. And I think there are many reasons it scaled, but you know, one important ingredient was the research. Let me discuss a second example, a uh, much smaller scale, but um, something I've got experience with, and I think sheds light on some general issues in trying to take research to policy. And that's uh, the example of deworming. So I was involved with uh, Ted Miguel in analyzing a small NGO program uh, that treated kids for worms, so hookworm, whipworm, roundworm. These uh, worms affect you know, literally billions of people around the world. Um, what we found was that treating kids for worms led to big improvements, not just in health, but improvements in school attendance. And in fact, this, and this turned out to be one of the most cost-effective ways to increase school attendance compared to many other things that, it's another example of, as a researcher, you often go in thinking about one thing, we thought about many, many other policies to increase school attendance. Turns out when you look at cost-effectiveness, this was, uh, it's actually, of all the things that have been looked at, it's second highest. Uh, there's another approach that's even, even more cost-effective, uh, happy to talk about later. So we had that evidence, and we went and we took that evidence, and like a researcher who had, I believe we had World Bank funding, we went, as we should, to the uh, permanent secretary and presented the results. And the permanent secretary, I think, was genuinely very, he heard about how much this cost, which is next to nothing. He heard about the results. He was excited about it. He wanted to scale it up. So we left the meeting very happy, and we came back um, a year later, and you know, not much had happened. And I think that, I don't think that was because the permanent secretary was being insincere. I think the permanent secretary was actually quite capable and quite sincere. Um, but he had teacher strikes on his mind. He had other things that were just much, you know, were much higher on his agenda, understandably. Um, so what, and it was very hard to make this happen within the ministry. There's one person for school health. They've got a lot of different projects going on. So what happened? Well, uh, after, after a few years, um, together with uh, Esther Duflo and others, we formed a small nonprofit organization called Deworm the World. And this was also uh, through the World Economic Forum. We raised a bit of money. That allowed us to provide technical assistance. So one of the, one of the well, actually two staff who had worked in the NGO that, uh, that was involved in deworming went on secondment to the Ministry of Education. They were able to do the hard work, the work that I think Olivier referred to, of not only of persuading people, but actually of coming up with concrete, implementable plans. It's one thing to have an academic researcher come in for, get an hour with the permanent secretary, talk about, re, talk about results on 10 different projects, one of which is deworming, and, and have the permanent secretary be interested. It's another to figure out, well, what's going to be, where are we going to get the drugs? Which districts in the country do we need to cover? How much is this going to cost? Do we, get, do we have to prepare a budget, get that into the budget planning process for the ministry, and so on? So that was part of it. The other thing that Deworm the World could do was connect directly with political leaders. So the prime minister uh, spoke about this at Davos, and, and that was uh, uh, very important. So Kenya, based in part on this, and very strong work from the from the World Bank, uh, the World Bank uh, uh, country director and the World Bank uh, human development person in Kenya were, were very, they were, they were very open to this evidence and they wanted to use that evidence in policy. So based on, on the combination of interests from the Kenyan government, some, uh, the, having people who were working specifically on this uh, uh, through Deworm the World and support from the bank, this scaled up in Kenya. Once this scaled up in Kenya, it became much easier to scale up elsewhere because policymakers were no longer looking at an academic article. They were looking at a country that had done this for three and a half million kids. And that made, after that, Bihar scaled up, reaching 17 million kids. Delhi did it. Um, uh, Rajasthan, I, I hope, will be next. Um, and other African countries have, have been doing this. So those are two examples of success. Let me, there are many other examples of things that, are, that, have, that have not succeeded. Um, I see I'm running behind. Uh, so uh, um, example is providing a kilogram of lentils with vaccination can greatly boost vaccine uh, uh, 
take up rates. Uh, providing girls with information on HIV rates by age of, of, of men can lead to a big reduction, 65% 60, reduction in pregnancies with older men. Why aren't these things scaling up? So I think policymakers are skeptical until they see an example at scale, and perhaps rightly so. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to scale, and a lot of adaptation. The institutional design that we have, this is not really anybody's job to do this. It's not the researcher's job to scale things. They don't have incentives to do that. They have incentives to publish. If you're the permanent secretary, you have a lot of things on your plate. Scaling up one thing because of evidence can't necessarily be your focus. The work of doing, of figuring out how do you take something from academics and scale it, that's a global public good because that has to be, the, the doing that doesn't just benefit Kenya, which in this case did it first, it provides a model which can be adopted by other countries. So I think we need some institutional reforms to try to improve the link between research and evidence and, and policy. So DFID is uh, requiring discussion of evidence as part of project appraisal. Um, DIME is, in, uh, I think, playing an important role, increasingly important role in the bank. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about USAID's Development Innovation Ventures, which is an effort I've helped, um, help you know, co-lead there. So Development Innovation Ventures is, it's basically a funding mechanism. We have an open competition for people who want to propose ideas. There's staged financing. Let me skip ahead. Small 100K exploratory grants. Uh, for people who want to try out another, an idea. Roughly million dollar grants, up to a million dollars to rigorously test it. And then for those things that are successful, we provide funds to transition it to scale. Um, typically they've been sort of in the five million dollar range, but they can actually go up to 15 million dollars uh, uh, to try this out and to develop something that can, we're, it's not our job to scale things, but we would like to help transition things to that stage. We have. Our competitions open across sectors very deliberately, and I'll give, provide a couple of examples uh, uh, to show why if you have a, sect a sectoral focus you may mi miss things. We focus on cost, evidence, cost effectiveness and on things that have the potential to scale. Let me give you an example. Um, so these are, are mini buses in Kenya. Um, traffic accidents are a number one cause of death for young adults in, in Kenya. And, and are increasingly important as a cause of death in, in the developing world. Um, these things, for those of you who have been on them, they drive very recklessly. Uh, that's a big, it's a big public issue in Kenya. I, the passengers don't necessarily want them to drive that way. But nobody wants to speak up. These are sort of tough guys who run these things. The insurance, the, there was a small scale experiment. Um, uh, uh, James Habirimana and Billy Jack, uh, two academics, were involved in the Matatu Owners Association in, in Kenya, an insurance company. They put up stickers in the, in the minibuses telling the passengers, speak up if, if the driver is driving unsafely. Okay, is that going to work? Who knows? It doesn't necessarily sound that, wouldn't sound that promising to me. Turned out when they did this, they saw a two thirds reduction. In the, in the rate of, uh, of, accident, of, seri of accidents causing injury or death. Obviously, a very, this is something potentially, it's very cheap, could potentially could be scaled up by insurance companies. Um, we provided funding for them to scale this up to the level of 10,000 minibuses to, to give this a try. Okay, let, me, um, let me skip over this. Here's another example of uh, uh, in Afghan. So this is an election monitoring program in Afghanistan, taking pictures of the results uh, at the polling stations and sending them back to reduce one, the possibility of one type of fraud it led to a 60% reduction in that type of fraud. It's since been scaled up in Uganda, um, or retested in Uganda successfully. Okay. Various caveats I could give. We're also supporting some private sector uh, efforts. So this is a private sector sanitation effort. Okay. The basic principles are open competition, staged financing based on rigorous evaluation. I think the you know, this is something that USAID is doing. The World Bank, I think, is in a great position to help lead this process of diffusion of, of, of ideas with evidence behind them. And it's, it's done that uh, in, in other cases. It's already playing a major role in testing. It has an unparalleled network for outreach to governments. It's got staff members who are oriented towards evidence. But I think there are issues of institutional design. How to stop this from being something that's in a ghetto in a research department or uh, I think it's great if it's in a research department, but how to get it out to the rest. 
how to deal with this when the bank makes loans to governments? What government wants to borrow for this? Maybe you need to subsidize this if, it's an, if it is a global public good. Um, those are issues, you know, largely, uh, there, are, there are obviously issues for the bank to think about. Um, but um, I did want to say that, um, you know, a, we're, 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 uh, we're, we're interested in collaboration and in development and innovation ventures uh, with the bank. Um, and you know, for all of you out there, we're on the web. If, you want to, if you've got an idea and want to submit a, a funding proposal, we welcome them. And that includes uh, uh, people at the bank, actually. Um, and we're, we, we draw very much on, we ask World Bank people all the time to review our proposals. So we're in, involved in, in institutional, in dialogue that way. But we'd welcome dialogue at the institutional level. Thanks very much. Thank you.